Self-efficacy is not, it's more than self-belief. It's different than self-confidence and self-esteem. And it effectively will allow you to thrive because it pushes you through all the change that is coming. I'm going to start with just a data point. If you're a young person graduating from Columbia today, you're going to have at least 20 jobs and at least seven careers. That's according to the World Economic Forum data. Just take a moment to think of what that means for all of us. At least seven job, at least 20 jobs and seven different careers. Um, from my perspective, that means you've got to think very differently about your skill set and mindset that prepares you for that new reality. This is not, of course, new. In fact, this World Economic Forum data is a few years old. The latest Future of Jobs report says that over 40% of our skills have to be relearned or reframed the next five years because of AI. So this trend is not going away. And this impacts us, obviously, as students, for those who are students in the room, but also as employers, as employees, and as parents. Actually, just raise your hand. I see a lot of people who might be parents. How many people in the room are actually parents? That's a really big proportion. <laughs> so I'm guessing as my remarks, I'll try to make my remarks actually relevant for all of you today, too, as parents, because I work with a lot of young people around the world, and I see what this macro trend means for what we do as junior achievement and as I reflect back upon my career, I'll tell you know, a few stories about my own career. I think it's so important to think about the core skill set and mindset that you need to thrive in this, in, in, in this brave new world. So I believe the one thing, perhaps more important than any other skill set mindset, is called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is not, it's more than self-belief. It's different than self-confidence and self-esteem. And it effectively will allow you to thrive because it pushes you through all the change that is coming. It's this unshakable belief that you will achieve, that you will actually have success. The unshakable belief that you'll be an effective marketer. The unshakable belief, if, if, if you're a young person, that you'll be able to go through all the job transitions that you're going to have. If you think about 20 job transitions, at least some of them will be involuntary. I mean, you're going to be fired multiple times maybe in your career. That's a very different future reality than maybe all of us might be used to thinking back 20, 30 years ago when we started and where we were graduates. So that mindset, the good news is it can be taught and can be learned. So as you as parents, as you as students, as you as marketers, as you as employees and employers, I'm going to give you four very specific things that allow you to learn to have this self-efficacy that will help you thrive. Actually, I'm curious, how many of you have already heard about self-efficacy? All right, good, about four or five hands up. I can't believe only one person raised their hand and said they were a J alum. We reach like 11% of all youth in America and have for many, many years. So I'm guessing you probably did JA when you were younger, but you may not think of yourself as an alumnus because you did it when you were so young. I know I did it, and I'll tell you the story about that in a second. But all right, four ways to build self-efficacy. Number one, hearing from other people that you will succeed. So obvious, right? If somebody tells you, particularly at a young age, that you're going to thrive as a marketer or thrive in your career or thrive in any way, your self-confidence goes up. Perhaps not enough to have this unshakable self-efficacy, but it goes up. Let me tell you two stories. So in my role, I get a chance to travel and meet young people all over the world. As you heard from Jenny's very generous introduction, we reach well over 15 young people in 115 countries. So part of my job is to travel. I was in Saudi Arabia multiple times. For those of you who haven't um, had a chance to visit Riyadh or Jeddah, the country is changing rapidly. And I went about seven years ago for the first time, and I've been back a few times since. And when I was there, I met a young woman who was in university at the time, and she was presenting her student business as part of our competition. Our brand there is called Injaz, which means achievement in Arabic. And she was presenting at the Injaz conference. And she was with three of her um, classmates who are also in the business. And her title was 
chief finance officer of her little student business. And they're all presenting, and she was um, wearing an abaya and a niqab, which is different than a burqa. You could see her eyes. Okay, you could see her eyes. And um, so she spoke up to uh, deliver the financial report for the business, and her eyes lit up. She just became a different person. She was obviously proud of their results, presenting gross margin, presenting their growth, project presenting their projections. And she spoke with this confidence that she didn't have earlier in the presentation when they were introducing themselves. So she also answered the questions that the uh, judges posed to her really well. And afterwards, I went up to her and I said, you seem to have a real knack for finance. You seem to have something in you where your eyes just light up, and it's something that perhaps you should pursue because I think you could be very successful. Small comment. We must have sp spoken for about five minutes. She sent me an email about a week later via LinkedIn. She, she connected with me and said nobody had ever encouraged her to think of herself as good at finance. And she said, thank you for encouraging me. It's made me reflect about what I want to study and what jobs I want to have and what career I'd like to have. I kept in touch with her. She sent me a few notes here and there. Um, and she went on and she worked for KPMG. Then she pursued an MBA. And I just had a chance to visit Riyadh a few weeks ago, and I had a chance to reconnect with her. And she sent me this incredible text message after our meeting saying how impactful that one comment was in really motivating her to think differently about her capabilities and her career. Uh, if in the questions, of Jenny, if we have time, I'll be happy to uh, read a blurb from it. It'll, it might make me cry, to be honest. But, but every time I look at it, it just reminds me how one comment that you make to somebody else can change their life trajectory. And much of what we do at Jay is help young people build self-efficacy. So when I see stories like that, I like to share them because it reminds all of you. In fact, when I speak around the world, one of the things I really like to say, and the big takeaway I'd like people to have, and it might not be the only takeaway from today because I'm talking about self-efficacy for all of you, but one takeaway I'd love for you to have from my remarks is, if you could go away and just say one nice thing to a young person to encourage them to have more self-belief in something they can do. You know, many of you raised your hand as parents. Of course, you'll do that for your kids. But think of doing it for somebody who's not your kids. Because I really do think it's free, it costs nothing, and you can fundamentally change somebody's life in a positive direction. So, second story is from my personal life now, of my own life. So I was born in India, and I moved to Canada when I was young. So I moved to Canada when I was six. And on the way, we stopped in Amsterdam. And unfortunately, I got lost. Um, at the Rijk Museum, which is a really big museum if you've ever been to Amsterdam. So I was lost for like eight hours. And uh, my parents were looking for me. I remember these tall blonde men uh, trying to give me some directions and I was just you know, unable to even communicate to them and, and lost. So, and then we landed in Canada, you know, eventually I found my parents, and we landed in Canada and I developed a stutter. People are unclear if the stutter was because of this traumatic event of getting lost or just because we moved from India to Canada and I was like, you know, clueless about the new country. So if you can imagine for a moment um, a skinny Indian boy with a funny name who stutters at the age of six, and I stutter until the age of 18 actually. So really for my entire teenage years and childhood, um, especially between six and 13, I, I also had the kind of stutter which was not like the quick repetition, it was a hard onset type where you were just, you open your mouth and nothing comes out because you're just waiting for that one sound. So it was actually quite challenging to make friends and be popular, it obviously it impacted my identity in a big way. And one of the nice things I tell myself, of course, reframing now, one of the nice things was um, I went to speech therapy once a week on Wednesdays at the hospital for sick kids in Toronto, if you know Toronto at all, it's a great hospital. And one of the things a speech therapist made me practice every week was public speaking. So every week, I learned to do what's called easy onset, and I got a different topic to speak about. I had to make up everything extemporaneously and become really good at starting words like this. And also, I became really good at finding synonyms in my head for different words. Because if you know anyone who stutters, I'm guessing some of you probably do, what you may not know is you know that you're gonna stutter on a word before you get to it. So you can actually get pretty good at changing words in your head and finding synonyms. And for me, this was, in retrospect, one of the best things to ever happen. 
because it made me a far more effective public speaker. So when, fast forward to when I was 18, um, you know, obviously I was, uh, um, um, I went from really being bad at stuttering and becoming a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. So I entered a public speaking competition at the age of 18 called the Winston Churchill Medals, which in Canada was a big deal, and I won. And I've got to tell you, when other people give you an award for something, it fundamentally changes your impression of who you are and who you can become. Fundamentally. Some of you have probably won awards and you know what I'm talking about, but that self-belief that comes from hearing other people tell you that you're going to succeed is transformational. And one of the best things about junior achievement is we give a lot of awards. We give awards to students, we give awards to volunteers, we give awards to board members, and I see in almost every case how transformational this third-party recognition can be. So number one, building self-efficacy, hearing other people tell you that you can succeed. All right, number two. Make sure I get my notes right here. Number two, learning by doing. Not, not necessarily learning by um, practicing being an entrepreneur by reading a book, practicing being a marketer by a textbook. This is by, by actually having experience, experiential learning. So one thing for my personal life is, and of course at JA, is we give young people the chance to have early experiences where they actually are a chief marketing officer, where they actually are a chief executive officer of a student business. So when you're 14, 16, 18, and you actually have had the title of CEO or CMO, the chance of you thinking that you can do it later in life goes up. Or put differently, if you haven't done it, the chance of you, like I did, magically thinking at 27 that you're going to start a business and be CEO of something is harder, although there's an exception in the room I see who didn't raise his hand, but yet is doing it. Congratulations, young man. So um, from my perspective, I, 27, started a business. It was called Circle Lending. It got bought by Virgin, Julie was on the brand team to rebrand it, thank you Julie, and I learned a ton, and hopefully Jenny will ask me some questions about brand in the Q&A afterwards, about how to build a really amazing brand. I've tried to apply some of it at JA. Um, so, learning by doing. When you have these early experiences, you start to be able to break through the mental barriers that hold you back from thinking that you can do something later on in life, and you actually build a little bit more of that, I'll call it self-confidence, self-esteem, self-belief, and it's getting to self-efficacy. Number three, so number one was hearing from others that you'll succeed. Number two, learning by doing. Number three, role models. Having a role model that's older than you that you see that's already done it. If they can do it, so can you. Now the trick here, and I'm guessing almost all of us have thought about role models once in our life at least, but is to pick a role model who actually has the same background as you. Somebody who has a representation which really helps you break the mental barrier. You know, for me, Richard Branson would be a wonderful role model, but he and I, let's be frank, are very different people. We have a different background. Um, and as I see young people around the world, I was just in Kenya, and to tell a young girl in Kenya to have a role model like Richard Branson to become an entrepreneur is somewhat unhelpful. In fact, it might have the opposite effect of making her think, geez, I will never be successful because I'm nothing like him. So as you reflect on picking a role model for your own career or perhaps for your kids now that you've raised your hand, really encourage them, encourage yourself to find a role model who has the same background as you. I guarantee it'll start to check your thinking that maybe you can do what they've achieved. So many people are not intentional about role models. They sort of bump into them as mentors or they find them as coaches, but that's a different thing. A mentor, a coach, and a role model are fundamentally different things. All important, but different. So as you reflect on finding a role model for yourself, particularly as a marketer, I see some you know, um, real energy in the room around that topic, of course. Think of a marketer who has the same background as you, who's, who's achieved something that you would like to achieve. They exist. Number three, role models. Number four, I remember. Number four is turning negative thoughts into positive thoughts. A little bit more than optimism, a little bit different. Turning negative thoughts into positive thoughts. If you master that skill, 
your ability to believe that the barrier in front of you is not permanent, <laughs> is temporary, starts to allow you to achieve. And there's some very specific, easy, simple things you can do to learn optimism. Some of you have probably heard the, of the book Learned Optimism, but I'll, I'll just pick one now because of the interest of time, I want to make sure I leave enough room for questions. In the interest of time, the one specific thing I'd encourage you to do is as you think of how to show gratitude, instead of saying, I'm grateful for this, I'm grateful for that, which a lot of us already do, I'm having a gratitude journal, et cetera, but find something that starts with the words, even though or despite. So in my family, we do this, we used to do it three times a day. I'm sorry, we did it every day. We picked three things with my kids when they were younger, where we found things we were grateful for. And at least one of the three things had to be starting with even though or despite. Because when you do that, what you find is you take a negative. So uh, even though I didn't buy glasses to watch the eclipse today, Matthew brought five, so I'm gonna hang out with him to borrow one of his. Yeah? So turning negatives into positives is a core muscle which allows you to build the self-efficacy. Thank you, everyone.